get started. All right, so we are recording. Everyone, welcome, welcome back. My name is Toby Lin. I'm a senior two. My name is Ryan Lim. I'm a sophomore too. And then today we have a very, very special guest. So would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I, I, I'm the honored one here to be with both you, Toby, and with Ryan. My name is John Hurley, and I am, and I am a nurse. <laughs> Great. All right, so uh, Professor Hurley, so one of the main questions we always ask when we have guests on is like, what made you choose nursing in the first place? Well, nothing really made me choose nursing. <laughs> it was more of a slow discovery. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing I ever imagined being, uh, mm -hmm. choosing to do. I, I never knew a nurse, let alone a man that was a nurse. I just didn't know anybody who was a nurse. But I suppose I had this idea of what a nurse was. And I was probably in my early 20s, and I was working in Mexico. And it was at an uh, orphanage. There were 700 children there. And there was two nurses that came one day and did some of the children there. And, and I thought, gee, maybe that's terrific to me. That was a good way to live. And I started to think about it. I didn't really talk much about it. I, when I came back to California, uh, you know, the world I grew up in, men just didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so eventually I remember Several months of thinking about it, I mentioned it to a couple of friends and, and I was thinking about going to nursing school and their response was, you can't do that. You're a guy. You know? <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I made my way slowly, slowly into nursing school. And so I've been a nurse now for, I guess, about 39 years. And, oh. I loved it. and I would say this, the choice to be a nurse is one I'm still making. Mm -hmm. And I'm still becoming one. Mm -hmm. doesn't and end. It doesn't end. Uh, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. And we just keep taking on deeper understandings and levels of what it means to be a nurse. And you mentioned that you were doing something like in your 20s with, in Mexico before you chose nursing, correct? correct. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Like what were you doing? before nursing? Sure. Um, so after high school, um, I didn't go to college. And I had a few, you know, little jobs that I did in uh, some uh, agriculture kind of jobs. I grew up in the city, San Francisco, and mm -hmm. I always kind of wondered what it would be like to work out in rural areas. A long, a long path, um, took me down to Santa Barbara, and there I did meet someone who had this organization uh, that I was intrigued at that did work in Mexico. And so I went on a trip there, and what was going to be a weekend ended up to be several months. Uh, yeah. And then actually, and that's where I kind of found my way. So uh, maybe wandering is, was the only way I could get to where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. After I was finished school, worked a few years, I did go back again and for what I thought was going to be, again, about two weeks, and I ended up staying 14 months uh, <laughs> That's awesome. at, uh, at this uh, place called uh, Nuestros Pequeños Hermanos. And there was about 850 kids there at that time. And I worked in the clinic. That's awesome. And it was a little hospital, too. We called it a hospital. Um, there was about eight eight kids that lived there all the time that had pretty significant disabilities, cerebral palsy, uh, spina bifida. So they lived at the hospital. Then we, would, we had about 20 beds where the other kids would come and stay if they were sick. It was a rural, rural little uh, village called Niacatlan, which is mm -hmm. the southern part of Mexico. And, uh, again, I learned more about what it means to become a nurse. And... Um as you know after you know finishing school and then going on to be a nurse for how many uh, for a long time do you feel like well like how has your perspective of the world of nursing changed because like for example for me you know 
fresh out of high school, all I was thinking about was like the mechanical side of nursing, doing, you know, the procedures, the hands-on things. But I, no one really, or I never really experienced or was taught about the emotional side of nursing or the mental side of nursing until I got to, you know, USF to Nursing 120. And then I kind of learned, like it opened my world up to a greater part of nursing. So how do you feel like your perspective in nursing has changed throughout your years? Well, Ryan, I, I think I got to nursing more in the humanitarian side of it. Oh, nice. And then entered into the mechanical side of it, <laughs> if say it that way. Mm-hmm. And, and I was, and I, and I still am very taken by the science and the, the tech parts of it. And I think they're terrific. I can tell you, as I've gotten older, I'm much less enamored by the, the mechanic parts of it. And I think Toby's probably heard me say this. I'm much more interested in the gardener metaphor. And, and instead of a mechanic fixing parts and picking pieces, um, I think I'm much more in the, in the mode of the gardener caring for something that's alive. Mm-hmm. The environment where it thrives and flourishes. And sure, you need to pull the weeds sometimes and you need to pull them, uh, but you need good weather. Good mm-hmm. And I think as a nurse, we can be part of all of that. I, I, the other way maybe I explained it here is, you know, if we think of the heart if, and we've got the, the right and left side, and you think of one side being the mechanical part, the science part, and the, and the other side, maybe the left side, being the, the art and the humanitarian part of being a nurse. And just like a body really can't survive on, with just one side of the heart, mm-hmm. you need both. So you can't just be a very nice, generous person, and, but know nothing. Mm-hmm. But you can't just be a, this super knowledgeable tech, the tech part of being a, a nurse and not the humanitarian part. So you need both, both sides kind of beating at the core of your career. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of complexity in being a nurse, I would say. But there's a lot of simplicity in it, too. And we tend to discount the the simple part of human beings caring about each other. And when we do that, we're operating on one side of the heart. And there's not much life in that. (laughs) And so, you know, when you talk about simplicity, for for you know the nursing students who are just starting out right where a lot of things tend to be pretty technical when you're learning just your theory classes and then you get to your first sophomore rotations where again it's a lot of technical stuff you do a lot of skills clinics you're working on your mechanics and even though you along the way you have classes like you know Jesuit in the nursing tradition and really moments where you get to focus more on the emotional and humanitarian aspects. In what ways um, can you give advice to nursing students when they're starting out on how to keep things simple, how to not get too sucked into that? And then also for our older students, our juniors and our seniors, people who have kind of been through the, the ringer, so to speak, how do they keep it simple when you kind of feel like you've seen it all at that point, right? Three to four years of nursing school, but how do you still keep it simple and focus on the things that matter? You know, Toby, I, let me put it in the, in the frame of a story. Um, so an anthropologist, uh, Margaret Mead, she studied hunter-gatherer society, so an anthropologist studying kind of human origins. And she was once asked uh, when the first broken bone healed. Uh, or so, I'm sorry, I've said it wrong. When did civilization begin? And she said the first broken bone healed. And so what she's saying there is someone stayed behind and cared for this person long enough to heal so they could move with uh, the tribe or whoever. Uh, 
was. And I like to think that was the first glimpse. Somebody who saw someone else's need and not just their own and nurtured that person long enough for it to heal. And so keeping that kind of as this core idea, perhaps a simple one, um, and then we get into an academic setting and by necessity, I suppose, there's a lot of and you know, to evaluate student progress and obviously needs to be done. But often, I think it's a human characteristic, we, we pay attention to what gets measured. We pay attention to what gets counted. And that's, it's much easier to test you know, what are the signs of hypoglycemia and hypernatremia than it is compassion. So our, our shift moves towards the stuff that we get tested on and we start forgetting about the original purpose. There's a, um, there's a woman who lived in the 1500s. She was a contemporary of the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius. Her name's Teresa of Avila. And I was in Spain last summer I walked across Spain last summer and I, came up, I was reading some of her stuff while I was there. And one thing she wrote was, no one has ever advanced so much in whatever work they're doing that they do not need to often return to its original purpose. And that, you know, we have to put in place that the, the, uh, the science part, which is, again, tremendous, is only the tool, it's not the, it's the tool we use to express our compassion and care. It's not a replacement of the compassion and care. Do you feel like, and, oh, sorry. No, go, and, and just one more, I'm sorry, Ryan. I think when it comes to these things, I don't think there's a nursing student at USF or anywhere else that doesn't know that how often we need to be reminded and rehearted of it because it's so easy. The other stuff moves in and obscures that view because I what's on the test? What's my GPA? What what grade am I passing this course? And you know, those the stuff we measure takes precedence sometimes to returning to the original purpose and using these things we're learning as any skilled person would use the tools of the trade to a greater purpose than these things in themselves. And that, I think, keeps us humble. We put this in perspective. I'm sorry, I interrupted you, Ryan. Oh, no, no. I was just going to, it was like on that topic where I think you are right, where there are, like, because of what we have to go through in nursing school in terms of like the material, everything we have, we need to learn and start uh, developing that critical thinking skill. Sometimes the, those, um, the compassion and the emotional side of nursing gets lost at times. And you were talking about these reminders that are so important to us. You kind of, do you feel like we need a lot more of those reminders incorporated into those nursing classes? Because I know that we're all like on a very, I think like, so like tight schedule in terms of classes, you know, every week we have to learn this, we got to learn that. But I think, you know, if you're not maybe part of a nursing club, that's, that kind of has those ideals of showing and reminding nursing students of that compassion, it can get difficult and it can be easy to forget about all that. You know? Right. And I, I think, Ryan, you know, we all need it in, as nurses as nursing faculty we need it as as staff nurses need it which is, that's what most of my career was as a staff nurse for 30 something years um, nursing administrators need it and and I think it gets back to that idea from Teresa of Avila no one is so advanced that they don't need to operate the original purpose and so be it you're not going to get tested on quality of compassion, care, uh, empathy. Um, in in an exam at school, you're not going to get tested on HESI. You're not going to get tested on it in NCLEX. Every day of your career, you will be tested on it. 
Yeah. And that's the real test. That's just preparation for that. Do you feel like it's something that can be taught in terms of like compassion and maybe the intangibles? Or do you feel like it's something that you really do need to experience throughout life in order to gain? Um, I, I think it can be taught, but I, and I think that's the purpose of a course like 120. Mm -hmm. um, but it, besides being taught, it, it needs to be nurtured mm -hmm. and given value. And not just, well, that's what we do if we have time left over. It, it, it's, it's the, uh, I think I put it in this context, is, is the, the work of being a nurse is, to me, sacred work. When you care for people, this is sacred work. And that's the real context that everything else is within. It's not an add-on if we have time. That's the way I see it. I think that's very beautiful. Um, so, okay, um, maybe going back to like, for the listeners that don't know, can you tell us a little, bit about, uh, a little bit about the area of nursing that you were in or are still in? Yeah. Um, so when I finished uh, USC, and I'm, I'm a grad of USF, like, uh, you will be. Uh, so 1982, yeah. don't think you were around for graduation that day. In spirit, in spirit, in spirit, in spirit. <laughs> right. I think I heard a whisper of your presence there. Just a little bit. <laughs> so, um, my first job was at San Francisco General, and uh, that was at the time when the uh, AIDS crisis was unnamed, HIV unidentified, by and so it was a stressful time. You know, another version of a pandemic um, at, a, at a different time. And uh, I worked on a med surg unit there. And, and I, I was quite happy doing that. And um, so I did that for a few years um, with my trip to Mexico somewhere in the middle there. That ended up to be about 14 months. And then... Um, and then a few times, and you're familiar with what it means to be, to float, you know, if another unit doesn't have enough nurses and maybe you have an extra. So I floated a few times in the pediatric unit. I have to tell you the truth, as a nursing student, probably my least favorite course was pediatric. And certainly my worst clinical experience was pediatric. And I thought, I'm never doing that. Um, so when it came time to float, it was my turn to pediatrics. Nobody wanted to go. So, well, it was my turn. So I guess I'll go. So I went. And it was such a different experience than I had, had previously. So whenever there was a need to float to pediatrics, I volunteered. And you kind of become, uh, you, you win a lot of points that way because a lot of people don't want to do it at all. And anyway, eventually I transferred to the pediatric unit there. And it's a good thing I did. Uh, I did. I loved it. And I spent about another three, almost four years, I guess, there. Um, met my wife there. Um, and, awesome. And uh, so it's, you never know what you're saying yes to when you say yes to something, <laughs> where that's going to be. And then um, she was finishing a pediatric residency at that time. So uh, after we got married and she finished the residency, we moved to the uh, Navajo Nation, Navajo Reservation. Um, and we were there for several years. And I worked in the emergency department of a, a small uh, hospital called part of the Indian Health Service. It's part of the Public Health Service of the United States. And in a tiny little place, isolated place called Fort Defiance, Arizona. I was very happy there. And I uh, might have been one of the only non-Navajo nurses there. And not only, it was like living, again, in another country. And uh, learning a new culture, new val uh, different values, perhaps, different way of looking at health. And again, uh, in fact, I wear this today. This is yes. made for me when I left there and gave it to me. So... Uh, um, I love that experience. We moved to Sacramento. I worked at UC Davis on uh, the pediatric oncology unit there for about four years, I guess. 
and then moved to uh, the East Bay where we live now. And I worked about 20 years in the ER at Children's in Oakland, staying with the pediatric world that I never thought I'd And yet that's most of what I've done. And now I'm teaching it, which is rather ironic since it was my, my least favorite class at USF. And I hope not too many students will be having that experience now. I'll be saying the same thing. That was my <laughs> class too. Um, but I guess the overall theme is we always think we know what we're choosing, but we usually don't know what comes with those choices. Mm -hmm. Just, I guess I'm pleading with anybody to be open to not only what we want and what we choose what the world is choosing us to be, what the world needs from us, not only what we want. And I think if we follow those two calls of authentic listening to self and to the needs of the world, we inevitably are in the right place. Even if it's it? not what we expect it to be in. <laughs> Uh, what was that draw you had to pediatric? You know, like you said, initially in nursing school, it wasn't the best experience for you. But then throughout your life, it seems like a, a large part of it is like being in peace. Like, what, what, was that, what was that draw? Well, I, I think it was, if I can tell another story. Of course. No, of course. Oh, yeah. Of uh, uh, train tracks. And I don't know if you're familiar with, if you have parallel tracks and there's a little switching piece. Uh, and I told me this recently, and it's about three inches. And if the train starts down one track and this switch is moved about three inches, the train moves on to another track and off you go to a very different destination. And this little tweak to go to pediatrics for me is somewhat related to that because I feel in my place, and, and it may change someday, you know, I'm not done yet. Um, that if you can influence something early in life, in this case, a child's life, you are magnifying where their destination is going to be 60 years from now. And they won't remember you or whatever, but you still play the, at least a small little three-inch part that put them on a different trajectory. And, and to me, that's a powerful influ influence. And oh, I that, definitely agree. And, and uh, I think another thing I like about pediatrics is um, they're uh, unimpressed by titles. They're unimpressed by, uh, you know, the, the, the trappings of adulthood. And it's yeah. a more honest place to be sometimes. I think that's really beautiful, actually. It's, I think that's really awesome how, like, you were talking about, in a sense, inspiration. And that kind of reminded me of, you know, I feel like me and to both Toby and I were, you know, we've had experiences of being in the hospital due to certain medical conditions early on in life. And I think regardless of whether we knew it or not, it kind of did plant that seed mm -hmm. for what we really wanted to do moving on in the future. So, of course, you know, I might not remember the names, the faces, or even what was said from my nurses back then. But I think the one thing that like carried on was what they did you know yeah. and i think that's just so important and also how they made you feel in that moment right it's really about the impact the lasting impact that you're able to leave on a child in the way that you make them feel even if they don't remember anything else and same thing with the goes for the family too right you're not just treating the the patient that's in the bed but you're also dealing with their home situation and all of these other factors that influence the rest of their lives and, you know just being that little you know like you said you're just kind of planting a seed you're just that little blip in their life but then the impact that it has on them is astronomical and it just keeps on growing those little things that you do early on well both of you are brilliant examples of that <laughs> thank you thank you uh, another thing I, I wanted to ask you about was, like, throughout your uh, journey in nursing, you were talking, you moved around quite a bit and been to many different places in life. And I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, that are still in nursing school uh, plan to 
maybe stay in one spot or yeah or just move to one specific spot and just stay there for the rest of our lives but you know i feel like like you said we should always be open and you and do you have a reason why you moved around so much um i think right you know i grew up in san francisco went through school in san francisco worked at san francisco general and uh, it was really f- through my wife that we moved to Arizona, the northeast corner of Arizona. And, and then again, probably for that reason and uh, family needs, we moved back to California and, and into Sacramento. And then um, just job opportunities for, you know, for family reasons uh, came up in uh, Oakland. And so we moved there and um, you know, there's, I suppose, I, I certainly would have been happy to stay in San Francisco General probably for my whole career. But mm-hmm. but there are other considerations in, uh, that come from the context of a person's life. And uh, I suppose that's why we moved, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I, I probably would have uh, hopefully grown in different ways and hopefully as enriching ways staying in San Francisco general. So I think it's not so much the exterior journey that matters. It's the interior one mm-hmm. that undertakes that really is the measure of, of the career. Not how many places are listed on a resume, mm-hmm. but what's happened inside them mm-hmm. and what's happened inside of those they've cared for because of the care they provided. And for those so that you did provide. Internal. Mm-hmm. And like for those that you did provide elsewhere beyond the Bay Area, like I can imagine, you know, of course the Bay Area is a very diverse population, but you know, obviously going to different pl- places in the world, you're going to see different demographics and different, t- all kinds of people. Do you feel like that kind of changed or gave you a new perspective on how to care for people in a way? I think so. I think that's, that's I like that thought there, Ryan. Um, I would say the most, the two most unique places I've worked is in, uh, you know, rural Mexico and rural Navajo land in uh, 8,000 feet elevation, uh, isolated place in Arizona. And I think uh, if I were to be honest, I would say I probably left San Francisco General uh, to go to this rural small hospital in Arizona with a little twinge of arrogance like I know so much Mm -hmm. you get there and you realize you got a lot to learn John (laughs) and and uh, you know people have are of equal value wherever they are and that's an immeasurable value and you know you you're students nursing students and you're going to graduate soon enough but I think a nurse is always a student of humanity and everyone has something to teach us. And um, we, are, we are their students. We are their nurses, but in some ways we are their students too. And they have a, a, a view of, a way of understanding humanity that maybe we will learn and incorporate or maybe we're, we're really turned off to. But still, even whether it's light or shadow, it, it helps us find our way. And um, and also I want, uh, so you mentioned that, you know, obviously back in your day, it was a way like, because right now, even still males are still the minority in nursing. And, but right. back in the day, you, you said you were talking to your friends and they thought that a, a male in nursing was unimaginable. Correct. So, so what was that like? Like maybe your first few years of nursing, like did you get a lot of discrimination, backlash? Um, you know, it, it's just another one of these cultural barriers, I suppose, that, um, you know, whether it's within circle of friends, family, or colleagues, uh, I would say it didn't feel good all the time. <laughs> it, it definitely did not uh, feel good. But, uh, but I have to say, I, for whatever reason, and it was a gift to me, I was convinced this was what I was supposed to be doing in the world. And 
whether someone thinks you are weird or not, I still go on. Uh, and and now I know it's much, much more common. I think, you know, I, I was in a class of maybe 120, something like that, and there were, I think, three of us that were men. Uh, and that was pretty typical then. And, uh, you know, you, you, you listen to that, your own song, and, you know, march to your own drummer, as the throw likes to say. Yeah. And, and trust in that. What else could, you know, we're not here to fit in someone's norms. We're here to follow our authentic path. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's pretty amazing to see, you know, role models like you in the nursing field where now in our, in my cohort of, you know, almost 130, we have about 30, give or take, male nursing students, you know, future male nurses, which is definitely a sizable increase from three out of 120 from from then and um so we're running out of a little bit of time for this for this uh particular zoom call but um one thing i did want to ask is you know, now that we're talking about times changing with your experience from the previous pandemic do you have any advice for how people can can act or how to stay level-headed or sane during this time where there's a lot of uncertainty with the COVID situation. Sure is, sure is, Toby. Um, I, can, I can think of, of this little phrase. I mean, it comes up, you know, in medieval times, the only social media available was was called the town crier. They'd go into the middle of a square and they would scream out, you know, now hear this, now hear this, and they would say whatever they would say. And that was now an H E A R, hear this. But I'd like to change that phrase to now hear H E R E. And so, what is our job now? So, and I think that works as a nurse and having worked so long in emergency and trauma kind of places where you can get overwhelmed like we can in a, a pandemic situation, but it's now, here, this. And that's what I give myself to. When I'm done, what's next? Now, here, this. So if it, if it is a position of a nursing student, and it is, you know, California Health Corps and, um, you know, people, and I, I have to say I'm part of this group too. You're, you, you're drawn, let's get out there and do things and make it happen. And yet, maybe our biggest impact in the long run is to do really well in studies now. So when your time comes, you really have a lot to offer. So... I would just, if I could answer it that way, Toby, now hear this. And if this is done well, you know, six months from now or Ryan, two years from now, you're in a different now hear this. And 10 years from now, a different now. But you're always attentive to the work at hand where you can make your biggest impact. That's great. And then do you have any... Um you know, since not everyone has the has been blessed with the opportunity to take your class, right, and oh, to wow. really get Could to know cursed. you. So, <laughs> you know, for the people who don't have that opportunity, or maybe have missed out on the opportunity, or maybe just want to refresh, you know, what things um, would you like to say to maybe former students who are, you know, looking for a little glimpse of, of your wisdom, or even prospective students, you know, the the what ifs, the people who never got to have the opportunity. Is there anything, yeah, you know, like like Ryan? Maybe you know what things <laughs> would you like to take the opportunity? Lucky Ryan. <laughs> um, I would I would say this um, without getting too narrow. Uh, understand that first and foremost, we're human beings or whatever else, and it's somewhere along that line, we're a nurse too. But not forget our humanity is, is more foundational 
and our career and where we work and what our status is. And to, I guess, always seek to make your work something that you would do if you didn't have to work at all. And to make it, and sometimes you, you're, you're in a bit of a mystery, like what is the right thing? I don't know what I should be doing. Um, if you always start with this, I want to be generous is always a good starting starting place you know can i offer in this moment to this situation to this person and sometimes for a student what can i how can i take care of these people maybe i can study well now because they're going to need me in about 27 years to know this and it's your gift to the future and uh and then you're a nurse working for 15 years. And again, it's how can I be generous in room seven, bed A? Now here it is. And, and uh, you know, take it, take it like that. And, and you will find it's impossible to give away more than you get back. That's just the, the math of nursing. The more you the more you give, you're getting more back. And that is an equation that defies mathematicians, but it's deeply understood by nurses. Well, how much time do we have left? Uh, less than a minute, but I think that's a pretty <laughs> good point to wrap up before Zoom kicks us all out. Thank you so much for Thank you. You know, coming on and sharing yes. so much experience with us. Well, you know, it's been really great to be with two future tremendous nurses. So it's my thank honor you. and I thank, thank you. you.